Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. Um, we got a fun show tonight. Going to talk all about USDGC and the storylines emerging from there, as well as um, a little bit into the Tour Championship upcoming. Before we get on to, into all that, I'm going to tell you about the sponsor of tonight's show, Manscaped. Um, introducing the Manscaped's newest innovation, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver, the game-changing tool that brings the luxury of a professional shave right into your home. Whether you're after that daily silky smooth finish or prefer to maintain a rugged 5 o'clock shadow, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver is your go-to for precision and style every time. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using our code Debate Night for 20% off plus free shipping. So what makes the Chairman Pro stand out? Well, it's all about versatility and precision. It comes with two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads. You have the skin-safe four blade foil that goes close smooth goes for that close smooth shave when you're looking to go completely clean and if a clean shave isn't your style that's okay just switch to the skin safe stubble trimmer to keep your stubble looking sharp and polished both heads are designed with skin safe technology reduce razor burn and irritation so your skin feels smooth and comfortable after every shave reducing redness or discomfort and it also has flex adjust technology this innovative technology ensures a superior shave um, by allowing both blades and the pivoting head to seamlessly adapt to the unique contours of your face and neck helping you maintain great contact with your skin at every angle and if you want even more precision on the right side of the bracket there's a precision lock when you lock it the blade head sits firm so you can have a more precise shave if you want to check out the chairman pro you can get it today by going to manscape.com and using code debate night for 20 percent off um, plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com. Code debate night for 20% off plus free shipping. Thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring tonight's episode. Um, the second to last episode of the season. We've only got one more left after this. We will go on after the tour championship just in case something wild happens. Um, but this is this is the second to last one. And as always, we're joined by the man of the people, Perry Smith. Yeah, man, the people here. Uh, good to be back. Good to be back. Good to be talking about uh, disc golf and not you know, the NFL here. So that's good. But I don't know what you guys did. I still haven't watched the podcast yet, but you guys probably pissed off the most people you've ever pissed off at grip really? because yeah, normally our oh, comment okay. section is like just debate night comments, but it's, it's trickled over the grip lock. <laughs> hate has been tri trickling over. And that was like the top comments. It was just calling you out for like letting Hunter get away with stuff and then calling Hunter out for like, not, I don't know. Um, I read a couple what? of them and then I just had to stop reading them. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Hunter and I did a tier list on, um, this should be a debate night topic in and of itself. Uh, <laughs> we did a tier list on disc golf pro tour events. Now keep in mind when Hunter and I do tier lists, they're pretty lighthearted. For example, we made it an entire tier that was just the E tier. And we put like all the European events in it. Like <laughs> it's not that serious. And also people, People have this interesting idea that Hunter and I don't consume disc golf because it takes us a minute to recap or rec uh, recall an event that happened in March. <laughs> I think here's my theory. I think the reason people think that it's crazy we can't immediately recall every little thing that happened in disc golf is because – it's because we watch every single week. I think if you watched only watched four or five weekends, it'd be pretty easy for you to remember, right? Because you didn't watch that much. When we watch disc golf every single weekend, it all melts into one. Like that's what makes it difficult. And then well, also, I think we need what we don't have at foundation right now is we don't have a savant that has insane memory. We need our KB. We need, yeah, we need someone that like not, none of us three have good memory. No, we can't, like, we can't recall things really well. There are people out there that have insane <laughs> memory that can tell you exactly what the score was yeah. of a, a football game that happened 10 years ago. Neither, right. neither one of none of us at foundation can do that. No, it was really funny. Cause at USDGC, we met, um, a few different people that like listen to it. Um, first we met the tour director or the event director of Des Moines, who was like, Thanks for giving us the A tier. Like that was great. <laughs> then we talked to Sean, uh, who works for the Pro Tour, and he's in charge of the OTB. And he was like trying to explain the saxophone thing to us, which was a really funny thing. Um, <laughs> and then the course designer and um, the tournament director, I believe, of the Crocole Open came up to us because we put them in like the A tier, S tier, and they were so happy that they gave us T-shirts, like Crocole <laughs> course T-shirt. Wow. Wow. So listen. You know, I, I, it's always, I think that was just an episode that, that you, like you said, it even trickled into our own comment section. Like I think so many non grip lock listeners saw it because they wanted to know where their favorite event live, but like, 
Yeah, I had people fired up. And like, I don't listen, you can, you can come after my take of an event all you want, but it, it hurts Hunter and I the most when people say we don't watch disc golf. Cause we spend so much time during the weekend watching disc golf. <laughs> can like, I add a it, comment that, here though, real quick, like yes. for someone who works in media myself, I think people don't realize that it's, it's not your full-time job to follow the tour and remember everything. Correct. Like you do pro tour coverage, but you're also doing a ton of other media. You right. run a store. I, like, there's I all that. And the other thing people don't realize is this shows that people will compare you to like sports center or whatever they have people giving them notes they yeah. have like materials someone's trying like, to get brownie it points either. here someone's trying to get brownie no, I like points this. i don't like this. this i don't like this <laughs> no a lot of our grip lock listeners brown think that's our full -time over job to just do grip blocked when it's like that's actually a like a i mean it's an important part of our job but it's a, one of the smaller media things we do sure. um any case side rant debate night that was the man of the people we're also joined tonight by gary in their defense, you did not put a uh, a graphic on screen of a tier list while you were doing a tier list, which is you know, job. It sends the internet crazy. Uh, no, I, I let my friends talk me into it again. The donut challenge wasn't enough. This this past week, we did 14 holes. You had to consume a, a 14 inch meat lovers pizza from Little Caesars and a liter of soda. <laughs> it was dang. it was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, a little bit of a teaser. We actually, I think tomorrow have a donut challenge video going up mm. on our channel and it Makes hurt a lot more way for me for that one. I would have crushed you guys. You, you probably were more to the dumplings. Um, I, I ate like 30 dumplings. I bet. Um, yeah. Hunter and I especially really got hit hard or no Connor and I really got hit hard in that one. Um, Sam, Sam is joining us as well tonight. Glad to be back. Glad to be back. Brody. Are you going to send me a check for my $20 or do I need to like Venmo request you? How does you that think I work? remember what you're talking about? Come on. Oh, what, no. what, what, <laughs> okay. Back off for one second. <laughs> Literally, what do we talk about? Brody wasn't no you were here for about. the episode, but at one point uh, earlier in the season, you said if Maple Hill, you were talking about the triple Mando on hole one at Maple Hill. And you said, if Maple <laughs> Hill doesn't have more scoring separation this year than last year, I'll give you $20. And it didn't. So you do owe Sam $20. Oh, really? And that's the facts. We talked. That was the episode you were supposed to be on before your flight got canceled. Yeah. Mm. I, have so what, what, I have it clipped if you want me to send it to What you. was the numbers? For the, identical. Identical. the numbers. For the, for the first day. Yeah, I think it was pretty much identical was the, was yeah. the theme. Hmm. You can look, review the numbers. Gary has the numbers. He's our number crunching guy. Um, mm -hmm. And then Dustin's also rounding how do you up find tonight. These, how do you find these numbers? Uh, looking at the scorecards on PGA or something like that. There used to be an easier way to do it, where you could find everything all in one place, and it was really awesome. And man, what saying, happened you, to that? I don't how know. How do you how do you how do you see <laughs> yeah. how do you see the scoring separation on holes? It, it's in like the stats in PDGA. You can you can see it. I'm going to help you navigate to it in the middle of the show. No, no, but no. I'm going to spend the next while you're talking and Trevor's talking. Okay. I'm going to spend the next thirty seconds to see if I can find Good it. Good luck. I you know okay. God well, speak to you. I'm not. I, yeah, I think we're done talking, and we're going to get into the first okay. topic, and you're going to be going first. So maybe uh, maybe save it for your off time. Um, you so let's it. talk about USDGC. First topic, Gannon Burr closed out yet another victory at USDGC, securing his second major of the season. But we're not going to talk about Gannon. We're talking Anthony Barella. So Anthony Barella fell short after taking a one-shot lead into the final round. What I want to know is, has AB already entered into the category of can't win the big one alongside Calvin, as an example, or is it too soon to slap that label on him? Obviously, a couple notable um, losses in majors now, uh, but it's not like, you know, he is kind of newer to that stage. So what do, we, what do we think about it? Is that harsh for that label, Brody? Yeah, I mean, I think for, I think for AB, it definitely is. Um, now, are we seeing AB do things that we normally don't see him do? I, I would say so, right? Like uh, the European Open, the the struggle that he had on fifteen or on sixteen, excuse me that that was weird. I don't think we've seen AB ever miss the same shot that many times in a row. Uh, and then the final round, there was like multiple shots at USCDC where you're like, "What was that? The shot on 11? I don't know what that was. I mean, his shot on seven was very bad, uh, like missing the Mando completely, not even hitting it. There was just a lot of a lot of shots that you could definitely tell were the cause of pressure. Um, but I, I don't think you can throw him in that category. Now, Calvin, 
I, I think he is definitely start. I mean, people started talking about that last year, you know, and this is another full year where he is uh, missing out. So I, I think Calvin is definitely in that category. Uh, but no, I, I don't think you can put AB in there. Um, one, because he hasn't really put himself in that position to win that many of these big ones yet. Uh, granted, the two times that he's really been in the contention down the stretch, he has kind of, you know, f- fluff some shots, if you will, down the stretch. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's fair to put him in that category. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, yeah, definitely some, that, that shot into the hedges was an all time. I was standing right there and was he blaming someone. No, I think he slipped. I think, I think, well, you never know, but it was definitely a quick look down to the feet was, okay. was where I saw him like, like look off went. to like the parking lot on the left. So I don't know if there was like oh, some, I don't know. I was standing or or something. He might have been looking for me for support. You know, okay. I, I wasn't Makes there sense. for him, Makes I guess. Sense. Um, Gary, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think that Calvin and AB are very comparable when you talk about this stuff because even though AB has been playing longer than most people realize, uh, like Bray said, he hasn't figured out the winning part until this year. Calvin's been winning since 2019. So even when it comes to majors, you know, AB has averaged 21st at majors since 2020 and 56th before that. And he only has two top three finishes. Meanwhile, Calvin has averaged ninth since 2020 at majors and 24th before that. And he has four top three most finishes. So, you know, I, the biggest reason we're talking about this is because of what we just mentioned here it was the european open from from last year that was the most egregious blow up i think we've ever seen um if he didn't have that then ian wouldn't have those the words tin cup as much as he does and then also we got the the recency of this past weekend that T shot on 11 might be the worst grip block I've seen from a pro. Um, but like I said, AB just started winning. So if he continues this trend of not being able to finish at majors from this point on, maybe we can start to look at that differently. Maybe we can start to make that argument, but there's a couple other things to mention here. And that's having a one stroke lead on the final round at USDGC, I think is meaningless because Winthrop has crazy swings. So it's not like he blew this massive lead. He just couldn't keep pace with the best player in the world. Um, also, I'd argue that he put together a decent finish to push what he could on the round i think if ab gets a title this year it's not i can't win the big one it's i can't win consistently or i melt in the rain yeah yeah melt fair enough rain. okay so so far not not quite convinced to put him in that category sam are you there yet i don't like agreeing with brody and gary but i'm gonna do it anyways <laughs> um when i read this question it was just kind of a head scratcher to me that it was even even a question that was being posed this is Anthony Barella's breakout season. This is the season that he has proven he can win on tour and that he is one of the top dogs that everybody's going to have to come in and, that, uh, and is going to have to beat every weekend. Um, to put him in the same category for major drought as Calvin is just a little bit absurd, uh, almost criminal, if you will. Calvin has been on the pro tour, has been winning disc golf pro tour events since 2019. This is Anthony Barella's first season ever winning a pro tour event. Uh, And not only that, Calvin has been losing at majors for so much longer. He has the volume of his losses at majors is so much greater than Anthony Barella's. It's, it's just not even comparable yet. I don't think that AB has had enough time and played enough majors to be anywhere close to the same category. I think I, I counted it up today since Calvin's first win on tour he has come in the top 10 12 times at majors six of which were in the last two seasons and he has not won a single one of those anthony barella since well this isn't since his first win all time anthony barella has placed top 10 in majors five times and has not won any and so ap has done it over his career where calvin has lost more majors in the top 10 just in the past two years Okay. So also not convinced. And, you know, maybe the comparison to Calvin is harsh, but Dustin, maybe even putting that aside is, would you even think about slapping that label on him? No, because he's really only had two opportunities where he's done it. Right. And that was the European open last year on one hole, which is a very punishing hole. And then this time around, it wasn't even like he blew up in one particular spot or blew a big lead. It was like a couple of errors that happened across the entirety of a round. And again, he didn't blow a big lead. I think also people forget that prior to last season, AB wasn't even a full-time touring pro. He was still splitting his time between school and disc golf. Now he's truly becoming a full-time pro in the last two seasons. 
And also, prior to this season, he didn't have any wins at all. Now he won four events and many other good finishes. And I think that people also need to understand that he had a massive rough patch after his win at Des Moines. Like, he has been struggling throughout the course of the season. If anything, the fact that he was able to get it together and have a big finish at USDGC is actually a nice sign that he was able to have some type of redemption, you know, after having so many wins, you know, early and middle of the season, then kind of really struggling towards the latter half where we really haven't been talking about him that much. He's also getting better at majors over time. He was 50th last year at the USDGC. And then outside of 2022, he also had several other rough finishes on that course. And this year he came second. It's by far his best showing at the U.S. Championship. So if anything, I think you could talk about as him building his way up as opposed to him, you know, blowing something or being a guy who can't win the big one. He hasn't had that many chances at it yet. Um, yeah, I just think that the big takeaway should be that he had his breakout season. He finally has wins under his belt. He's finally putting himself in contention at majors on a more consistent basis. And uh, he just lost to some really great players. I mean, he lost to Burr, who is a fantastic player, and Isaac you know, at Worlds last year, who was also fantastic. So, yeah, I'm not going to give him that label. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I do think there are – the thing is, you know, it's tough to know, like, okay, are those going to be AB's true colors, you know, when it comes to getting in contention to major championships? Because there, there's a difference, you know, two examples that are obviously two of the best winners when it comes to major tournaments. Obviously, Gannon Burr, when he gets in any kind of control, and he was doing this from the first United States championship he won um, as a teenager, where he just was very ice cold down the stretch. Um, and then Isaac Robinson's another one who hadn't really done anything on tour, but you put him in position to win at a few majors and he's taken advantage of it multiple times now, three times now. Um, so I think there are definitely signs that certain players just can take the big moment and do something different with it. But I, I you know, I agree. It, it's, it only has been two, both this season and both somewhat notable, but um, I think it's probably a little early to slap that label on, but I don't know that it, it was, I think it was rougher than like, and I was in person, so it's always different, but if you saw the body language and just the way that round played out, it, it, it was rough. Like it looked like he was holding on for dear life basically. Um, so we'll have to see, there'll be a whole nother season, obviously of, uh, opportunities next year. And I of course agree that Calvin is way further into that category being, a consistent pro for so many years now and, and not getting a major win. That is, but, but Calvin, Calvin also might slip out of that. If he doesn't continue to start winning consistently, like just in general, like but you I, only yeah. really, you only can really be in the category of like, can't win the big one. If you win other events, yeah, mm -hmm. it would become, couldn't win the big one. If, he, <laughs> if, if he you stops know, winning yeah. all together. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's true. That's yeah, you got, you got to consistently win and then not win when it matters. You yeah. know, for that to be a, a storyline. Yeah. I mean, he's still one of how many players with multiple wins this season, though. Like, yeah, I was about to say, Brody, are you saying are you that he's not list? a consistent winner on tour this year? I'm saying this year he wasn't as consistent. Uh, his play wasn't as top-tier consistent as he was uh, the previous season. Yeah, definitely previous, true. Previous season, he had the best season of all time prior yeah. to... Gannon's season this year. He had, yeah, he had some of the but he didn't win a major. early, but yeah, he he wasn't really able to to right the ship this year. I, I think Calvin will definitely have a bounce back year next year. But yeah, valid points, valid points. Um, okay, right. talking about a player who might be at the end of their window, uh, Paul McBeth. So after failing to capture the USDGC title, Paul McBeth's remarkable streak of 13 straight seasons with a win has come to an end. Uh, I don't know if they would consider the Tour Championship part of that streak, but I certainly would not because. I think that's an entirely different event. Um, so is it safe to say the Macbeth era is over or is there a chance we could still be in store for a final chapter? What might that look like? If so, um, obviously there's the question of age, field strength, things like that. You know, how are we perceiving things? Are we going to see kind of another chapter of, of solid play out of him or is what we're seeing now? Is that, is that what we're looking at? Gary, what do you think? Uh, this, this stat has the Macbeth crowd pretty furious. I think you could pave roads with the excuses that are being put down for Paul this season. Um, but like <laughs> looking at the season itself, like he had a rough start. I mean, he got second place at Music City uh, because Simon's putt was alive that weekend. And he got seventh at Portland. But his year really didn't get going until he hit the European swing, which is where he got his win mm -hmm. last year. Um, but this is a hard thing for Macbeth fans to hear. But we all saw the eventual slide was coming. I mean, Paul could only be on top for so long. He doesn't look physically like he used to. He's having a hard time with his putt sometimes and the field continues to develop rapidly every single year and as more pros travel to Europe those events feel a lot less snipeable for him um, so I think it's safe to say that this is the first big step we've seen of 
of coming out of the Macbeth era. You know, I stand by my point earlier this year when I said that I think he's done for majors. Uh, I think he still has wins in his tank, but they're going to be few and far between. I mean, if he does have a final chapter, it might be a win or two on the tour, maybe some good final round pushes. But the truth is that the days of chasing people down by going McBeast mode for one round out of a three round event just isn't enough. Um, and I can hear the commenters already saying, like, what about MVP and music city? Like I said, Few and far between wins are possible, but um, what we should be focusing on, though, for Paul is what the real final chapter for him is going to be, and that's his transition to like the mogul side of disc golf. You know, running a fantastic foundation, spreading disc golf throughout the world, selling discs left and right. He's becoming a pro tour course designer. Um, he's becoming a you know a major ambassador for the sport, and that's something that I think the sport could use right now. And that's a final chapter that's worth writing. He's going to keep competing. He's going to still be great, but this is the first time he'll be on the outside looking in. All right, Gary, Gary, putting him to bed. Paul, Paul, chat the Paul book closing. Uh, Sam, what do you think? Listen, I think, in, in my opinion, Paul Macbeth is the goat of disc golf. He is the greatest to ever do it. And I'll say this: the Paul Macbeth era does not end this year. But I only say that because I think the Paul Macbeth era has already ended. I think, I think at the end of the twenty three se- twenty twenty three season, we kind of. S- it's been it's been phased out at this point um in the past three years the only great thing that he's really i mean he's he's had a couple of wins here and there but we're really still holding on pretty hard to that 2022 world's win like that's that's that is he's just kind of been coasting on that he picked up a win last year he didn't get one this year so i can see where the question's coming from is it just now phasing out I think other players have taken that over at this point. I, I, I think it is a new era of disc golf. The Paul Macbeth era has already ended. Now, what is next for Paul? You know, I'm not sure. It, it's not going to be the same chase down victories and unbelievable putts, ultra consistency, a sheer dominance. I do think it's going to be him getting in contention and showing that he still has some gas left in the tank, show that he is still a top tier professional, I just don't think it is going to be the Macbeth error that we had for 10 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair to say. Um, I definitely was wondering if anybody would bring that take and um, I I agree that could be the case. We'll we'll only know looking back, I guess. Um, Dustin, what are your thoughts on the Macbeth era? Has it already come to a close? Yeah, I think it came to a close a couple of years ago, actually. I mean, I think for me, an era is an extended stretch of time where you are dominating the field, or at the very least, you're consistently winning and consistently, you know, placing at the top of almost every event. That's how you have an era. It's an extended stretch of time. And so I really think that, like, we were still certainly in the heyday of Paul Macbeth's era in 2019 because he wasn't winning a ton and was still very much at the top of the leaderboards most of the time. Obviously, 2020 is kind of a wash because of COVID. But but even 2021, he only had three wins, but he was against the top 10 guy. So maybe you keep this era going at that point. I'm not sure. But then 2022, he's winning even less at that point. Uh, and then obviously last year was, was definitely disappointing. If anything, I think this year overall was better than last year. I think he was in the contention more often this year at the big events in the U.S. in comparison to last year was really only the European events where he felt like he was in contention outside of like maybe a couple of exceptions. Whereas this year he had several events where he was in the mix and, and had some big finishes. Um, so, yeah, I think he actually made some improvement of uh, the European Open forward. As far as like his final chapter, look, I think Macbeth can still certainly be a top player on tour. He certainly showed that from the European Open forward this season. He could still place in, in some pretty good positions. He could still make some runs at a win. I do think it's very possible he could still win again. He's definitely capable. It's just can he put it all together to finish it off against the field we have today with so many consistent players? I think injuries have been a part of it. You know, he's, he's brought a child into the world now. Now he's got to bounce disc golf and other things in his life so maybe once he figures that out and and, you know gets it all together i think a win is possible but yeah the air has been done for a while okay okay fair enough um brady wrap it up what are your thoughts yeah i mean i think we all kind of are agreeing on this i think it's you know just seeing his performances and stuff it's uh, my my takes maybe a little bit different than others because there are people that say that players have gotten worse. Like some of these players have gotten worse. And my take is like, I don't think maybe, maybe they're not as consistent, but I still think like their top end game is probably better. Like I think Ricky, when he plays his best is probably better than Ricky back in 2015, 2016. So I, I still think if Paul plays his best, I don't think that's like a crazy much lower bar 
than what again i didn't watch these guys play back then so i'm just i'm just speculating off of videos of them playing back then versus watching them play today i just think majority of people have gotten better it's just when you don't play that well or you have an off day you actually slip and the easiest way of seeing this is like there was a shift in paul's season of where he started playing better disc golf than he was at the beginning of the season, right? Maybe that was a health thing. Maybe it was feeling better, whatever it is. But the perfect way of seeing it is like at that second stretch, that European open stretch, I think Paul played pretty consistent throughout the rest of the season. But the difference is the field over in Europe, when he's playing at that level, he's getting second, six, third, second. And then when he's playing that same level in the States with a much deeper field, he's getting eighth. 16th 12th like obviously mvp uh was the outlier of where he really did play really really well but like that just shows you right there like i don't think he played worse when he came back from the european open it's just you now have seven guys that are playing a little bit better than you and so you don't finish in third you finish in 10th and that's just basically what's happening yeah um i yeah i agree with that i think that I, what i've kind of landed on at this point because at this point i think we've gotten far enough away from the injuries that I think that like see, people are still throwing that down as an excuse. And I don't think that's really a factor anymore. I do think the injury combined with having a kid, I think he got a little out of shape. I think he got a little out of practice and I think that showed. And I genuinely don't think, and, and I think he's even admitted that. And I don't think he's still all the way back just at the best he can be at the moment. I really think if he took an off season and really, really hammered in and some guys at that age and, and have other things going on, that's just not what they're doing anymore. You know, he's played a long successful disc golf career. He's gotten a huge contract at this point. So maybe that's just not where his priorities are at, but I still think if he got back into peak shape and can get just work out some of the inconsistencies in his game, because I, I think a lot of the issues I see are lack of confidence on the putting green that you just didn't see before. And just some errant shots. Cause he's, I think, I still think he has all the shots. You know, when you talk about age, um, you know, there are certain things that, that can come with that, but, but it's not like Paul. Can ancient. I, like, can I, yeah. can I just add two things to that? Yeah. So two things, obviously in a lot of sports, disc golf, not being any different, you can grow and get really be good very quickly and have like massive improvements. But then when you get to the very top of where these guys skill level is the amount of time and effort it takes just to be a little bit better it is it's a lot. Right. And yeah. so like he might yeah. be making that decision of like, for me to get a little bit better, I have to spend twice as much time as I'm currently doing. Do I want to do that? I don't know. The other thing, the other issue that he's having now is when he was, showing up to tournaments everyone was like i hope he doesn't play well so i could potentially win right now he's showing up to tournaments and he's saying i hope these guys don't play well so i can potentially win he yeah. is no like that is that's the big confidence thing he's stepping up to a 40 footer back in the day he's the guy he knows yeah. he's the guy you and have that inbuilt confidence that everyone else is going to falter around you where now like these guys don't care yeah, no, no, no one cares. There, there is no Paul Macbeth effect. Like it, it yeah. doesn't exist anymore. So no, it's a big, that's a big part of golf. I mean, and I think Gannon has kind of stepped into that role now where people are know if Gannon plays his best, you're just not really going to beat him. Um, and yeah, I think it's a big shift. I, I to be but clear, Gannon's I think, not beginning. Is not uh, beginning? Doesn't have what Paul used to have though. Like Paul, I think made people worse around him because of the intimidation factor and the scariness factor. I don't, I don't think know. Gannon Gannon doesn't have that though. <laughs> Gannon's fist pumping people. Gannon's saying yeah, nice. Yeah. It's not. It's That's not. It's different. It's, it's, it's not that way. It's, yeah, I was saying. I think what, what makes Gannon int intimidating is like you watch a USDGC final round when he messes up. It's so few and far in between that I feel like the other players trying to catch him just tense up so much trying to make a play because they know this might be their one chance. I mean, we saw it a few times. AB would see a mistake from Gannon and then mess up right behind him because I sure. think it actually just mm -hmm. elevates the tension. I think that's where Gannon's intimidation is, is because of his consistency. I don't think it's his, like his aura. Or anything. Correct. It's because he keeps control um, of the tournament once he has it. It's not the right. comeback yeah. effect that Macbeth had, like the exactly. fear of him being in the rearview mirror. It's the fear of this guy's out in front of me, and I don't yeah. think he's ever going and give me a chance to get ahead of him. It's a different it, type of thing. It's just exactly. any any course where it's just who can throw the best and who can t putt the best. Gannon is the favorite by a, yeah. by a lot, and it's yeah. just the courses and have to get harder. There has to be more course management. There has to be more of that 
to where it brings in other parts of the field. Otherwise, I mean, I literally said before the tournament, Gannon's going to win because he throws the disc the best and he puts the best. And that's yeah, what well, this course right now is set up for. It's just so the, very straightforward. The only thing that changes that is adverse conditions. And there was none of those to be had. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, to wrap that up though, I, th I think, yeah, if Paul, I think if Paul does play himself back into the best form he could be at right now, I still don't think that looks like any form of like any dominance, but I do think the few times that, he had close losses, maybe those turns into wins and we could look at him getting a two, maybe three win season um, and playing a little more consistently. Cause he I can think still that's... win five to seven years from now. Yeah. Absolutely. Like his, his window of wins is still like right. multiple years from now. Right. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, okay. We're going to move on from that and kind of, well, we're kind of going to get back to the throw pink here a little bit later, but we're going to talk a little about the, the pro tour championship. So with the tour championship approaching and debuting uh, a new format, once again, uh, kind of a, the cleaner format than we've kind of had in the past. Um, are you considering this event much more than a cash filled exhibition? Will this tournament ever be considered more or does the timing and nature of the event set a cap for the amount of hype it can carry? And I uh, also want to know, should the victor gain any brownie points towards postseason awards? Um, how do you kind of consider it in that um, realm? Sam, what are your thoughts? Am I considering this event anything more than a cash filled exhibition? Absolutely not. Um, will this tournament ever be considered more? I'll say probably not unless there is serious change. Um, sure, there is a lot of money on the line at this event, but we're also at the end of a long disc golf season, and I think everyone is tired. The fans, the players, the media, everybody is just kind of ready for a little bit of a break, ready for something different. And while this tournament is different, it is not the kind of different people really look forward to. It's 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 the same style as every other event. You just gave the best players in the field a little bit of an advantage when they're playing for the biggest purse they're going to play for all year. In my opinion, I think it's kind of dumb. I don't understand why the Disc Golf Pro Tour sees value in this event and spending so giving away so much money through this event when they could turn it into something like an all-star event and spread it with a little bit less money and spread the purse that would have been given out here to all of the majors across the year and make them more valuable to the players. I don't understand why all of the Pro Tour's eggs are in this basket and not being thrown other places. It seems like a, a big purse to be at a, at a, a one-off fun type of event. And absolutely no, no points should go towards any sort of awards for this type of event either. I think that's dumb. Okay. Interesting points. I do think it is fair to say that, you know, it is interesting that the most money, you know, one of the biggest purses all year does go to this event that we're even discussing its legitimacy, essentially. Um, Dustin, what are your thoughts on that? I pretty much disagree. Um, look, I do think that this event is in a weird place where it certainly is never going to be as important as a major. And it's very hard to put it as an elite series event as well because of the format. But it is at the end of the day now a four round stroke play event similar to an elite plus event. The difference being that you're giving a stroke advantage to people and rewarding them for their consistency across the season. This is a format that we see in golf. This is a format that people understand like and this actually was a lot of people were calling for instead of the whole skipping around thing that we were doing before. So if anything, this brings it more in line with being an event that people want to see. And look, at the end of the day, they're still playing a top tier course. It's still top tier competition. It's one of the strongest fields you're going to play because it's only the best of the best in the season competing. So I do think that it's more than just an exhibition. It's not like the All-Star Weekend where everyone's just out there having fun, doing competitions, messing around, not playing for anything. Like you're still playing for the title of tour champion. You're still playing for the money. And yes, it's not as much value as a major. I'll never say it is. And it, it, it's like, I don't know where you compare it to an elite event or an elite plus event as far as value but i do think that there is something to it i do think that there is some importance there i can't just toss it away um now do i think that it will have any impact on the end of year awards no we all know who the player of the year is for both divisions at this point it's not going to really sway that i think it's the same for a lot of the other awards so yeah i don't think it'll have impact there but i i don't think it's fair to this brushes event off as if it's nothing um are there better ways to do it maybe but comparing it to all stars is a joke 
Okay. All right. Um, Brody, what do you think? Where do you think the tour championship falls right now? Okay. So I, I think, I think what's happening here is, is the tour, you know, the disc golf pro tour wants to have an event that is like theirs that rivals the majors, right? Worlds is a PDGA European open is over there dealt that way. Uh, we just saw Innova's major with USDGC champions cup also with the PDGA. So they don't have a stake in any sort of event. Again, this is very similar to golf of where the PJ tour doesn't have a major. So what did they do? They turned, they made their own event. Now it works really well in the PJ tour because the event is not at the end of the year. The event is at a really good time slot in a really good time to where people are excited. It's also at a very iconic course that people love. Uh, however, they are still trying to make it a major. It's never probably going to be that. I think this is where the, the Disc Golf Pro Tour kind of messed up, is they actually copied the format from the PGA Tour of the playoffs. And I believe the PGA Tour only created the playoffs and only created the Tour Championship because FedEx wanted to give – and be like the title sponsor. FedEx wanted something throughout the entire year, right? They wanted something big. And so the tour, the tour is like, we have to create this. And that's been a lot of pushback at the PGA tour. And I think this is one of the things where it's like, I don't think we should have copied the PGA tour here. Also, it needs a better course. Yeah. Yeah. A better venue would definitely uh, help lift things up, but good points there, Brody. Um, Gary, what are your thoughts on this? I think there's still a lot of pride for the players in both competing in and winning this event because, I mean, we're looking at the top players in the field. It's the, it's the toughest field they're going to be playing against this year, and, and especially as the field continues to improve from year to year. And I think the format's really solid. It feels like every year we've taken baby steps closer to what people want to see. You know, last year we had the stroke lead, but there was a cut and reset. This year they made that right, and it's now it's just a straight-up race to the finish. And I think even though Gannon is getting 10 strokes, this is Nevin. Um, I think exceptional play over four rounds can erase leads like that. Um, and money is definitely a part of the identity of this event. That's a big deal with it. It's, it's the third highest purse of all time at $300,000. And every single participant is getting money, which is great for the players. Um, I like it also being the last event of the year with, um, you know, go out with a bang kind of mentality to it. And maybe we'll get another electric hot mic moment on hole 18. But I think there's a lot of good things about this event, but there are some glaring issues and one of the biggest ones is that it's back to back to USDGC and literally within 45 minutes of each other, because that's pulling from the same crowd of two weekends in a row. And it's not really realistic because when the average person has to pick between those two weekends, they're picking USDGC. They're not picking um, the tour championship. And I think having a um, no break week between the events is, is, a, is a big miss. So if the pro tour wants this to be a premier event, give everyone the extra week there. Um, it'd be good for fans and players. Maybe consider alternate venues that don't exhaust the same populace of people. People. And to address the last point, this should count towards end of season considerations if things are close. A win at this event must mean something. Um, so you got to factor that in. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the best you can say about the tour championship and the best way to look at it is as a kind of reward to the players ultimately like let's let's especially let's try to reward the players who played the most consistently all, all season because that might not always equate to something because i do think because of the proximity to usdgc and where it falls in the calendar and you kind of do have to put it towards the end of the season at some point um and in other factors i i don't think this event is ever going to be it's never going to be as big of a success as probably a lot of the normal pro tour events or especially the majors but I do think it's fair to at least say, okay, we're, you know, even though it is interesting that an event of that stature has one of the largest purses or even sometimes the largest purse. Um, I, I think it's at least fair to say, okay, we're, we're taking that and we're giving it to the players who were best all season. So to me, that's what it kind of feels like. It's a fun little finale, but I, yeah, I do think because of where it sits and, and all those factors, it's never going to be huge as a competitive spectacle. It, it really is more of like a fun thing and it, and it can produce a fun storyline, right? If somebody comes from behind yeah. a good bit and takes the cash like that, that's exciting. Cause I mean, you look at the, look at the earnings this year. I mean, Gannon's at 176,000. So the, their storyline, a, he could break 200 K, which would be insane. Uh, but then, I mean, you look behind him, the next down is Ricky. Like he's like 70,000 behind. So there, there are a lot of players who could really improve on their earnings. Um, I think once you get behind, 
once you get behind like uh, Ezra Robinson, it gets down to like 45,000. So there's a lot of guys who could like double their earnings if they can make a comeback. So that, that, that at least is interesting. It's fun to like kind of support the players and be excited for them in that fashion. But, but that also puts a lot of pressure on this tournament because if you lose Barbasol, right? If Barbasol is like, hey, we don't want to re-up, we're done. Yeah. The PJ Tour now has to scramble and try to find a big, big sponsor because, again, that's kind of what this event is. It's a, it, like you were right. saying, it's like a rewards to all the players that did well. Yeah. But if it's less of a payout than the tournament they literally just played down the road the week prior, that's it's just it's going to be a tough look. So that's well, the, the identity mm-hmm. of this event. Is, yeah. it, it doesn't seem like it's going to last. Is there a trip? Yeah. We'll get we will get to that in the final the finals question uh, dealing with the payout. But yes, that is its entire identity rests in having the big payout. That is absolutely the truth and the guaranteed money. Um, okay, we're going to talk uh, last topic here about the throw pink championship. Um, so the throw pink championship is still suffering from an identity crisis. It's run alongside a major and treated in the same manner. Um, do you think a PDGA has any good reason to withhold another major from Innova given the track record? And then also given the track record of the PDGA and the success of the USDDC under private ownership, should there be a bidding process for majors to award them to more committed and capable entities? Um, Dustin, what do you think? So first and things first, just combine the two, like, let's just get rid of throw pink and just make it USWDGC and just get rid of USWDGC. I mean, as everyone knows, this tournament, this course, this environment, it's really only second to worlds and prestige and history and so forth. It's also the big money out there besides worlds and the pro tour championships. So this really should be valued in the same way for FPO has the same strength of field that plays on difficult course, just like MPO does. It should get the same title. Uh, it's also an issue that USWDGC varies year to year on the quality of it. You know, sometimes there's been complaints about courses. There's obviously complaints about whether it's being covered appropriately. And we all know that the disc golf at the top is best when the two fields are combined. That's far as viewership on the course and online goes so let's just get it done we already kind of treat it as a major in our hearts and i think it's sad that someone like holland hanley who won it last year doesn't get the credit of winning a major and didn't even have the credit of winning a tour event until she won the beaver state fling this year because it was considered an a tier like that's not really the way things should be when you consider how strong that event is for the fpo field so i don't like that um as far as like you know manufacturers controlling a major i do think it can be problematic because there can be certain abuses taken by a manufacturer not letting other manufacturers be involved you know things of that nature you know there, there could be some conflict of interest there but at the end of the day if you want a good major then you have to have the people invested in it and i think the only way that they can be invested is if they have some type of ownership some type of incentive for running it and that will indeed make the major better because it's not just you know the pdj and volunteers who don't really have that investment or that reason to make it the cream of the crop you have people who really are looking to make it as as good as possible so that they can have the most market success from it too so i, I think that that is probably something that needs to be looked at yeah yeah that's definitely a fair point um brody what do you think should should uh, there be some more private ownership of these major championships yeah no i think i think the answer to that is definitely yes uh to go to the throw pink question yeah i mean i think it's the weirdest thing that this is the only event all season that you know the stakes are not equal between the mpo and the fpo again i think the way that disc golf is headed makes a lot of sense. I know there are people being like the men's game out there subsidize subsidizes the women's game. I don't know if I 100% believe that anymore because of Krista Tatar and because of how popular she is in the European markets as well. Um, I think she brings a huge uh, population, a huge fan base into the sport. And I think she continue will she will continue to do that. Um, so I like the fact that they've kind of paired them together and continue to pair them together. This is just one of those things that doesn't make sense. And we've never really gotten a reason for why, like the PJ has never really come out and said why they can't make it a major, or at least I haven't heard anything from them saying that. So I think you get rid of the women's, whatever that thing is the beginning of the year that no one really pays attention to because it's just like randomly in the middle of the year and make this, a major. And so then it's four and four. It makes a lot of sense. The other thing for the private thing, I think the biggest problem right now is like tournaments don't make money. The majority of tournaments do not make money. And so to get someone to want to invest and put a lot of time and effort into it doesn't make any sense when it does make sense. Then I don't think the PDJ should be involved with any majors except for one. And like they can have their one major and they can spend a lot of time with it. And everyone else has their one major and they can spend a lot of time with it. That makes the most sense. Yeah, that is fair. It's not a huge business proposition at the moment because 
there might not be business to have. I mean, it, it's taken a long time to even get USDDC to something that feels like it could be profitable. Right. Um, Gary, how do you think this all shifts out? Yeah, this is interesting because you know it's, it's USDGC week because this question pops up repeatedly. But I think the obvious thing here is that Innova kills it with USDGC. <laughs> if there was ever an argument to keep the PDG out, this is kind of it because, um, I mean, bidding might be the way to do it with uh, these these private ownerships and having you know that that feeling of needing to run it as best as they could. It comes with its own set of politics. But there's, this is a tough spot to be in because, uh, honestly, I don't think I want to see the U.S. women's go away because this event is a huge standalone major for the FPO field. It also brings out uh, 350 competitors and is a major thing for the growth of women in the sport of disc golf. Uh, it's just weird that they have it in March every single year. But I think having the throw pink, that's got to be a major, makes a lot of sense because the venue is already perfect. The crowd is already there and it has all of the impact. It just doesn't have that like official prestige. Plus if 95% of the community sees it as a major, let it be a major. And if it's not going to be at least combine it on the scoring app, because bouncing back and forth was ridiculous and I hated it. Um, but the new issue here is that that might make five majors in the season for the FPO field and scarcity and exclusivity is a big thing for majors. Um, so I don't think combining them is doable because it's too big of a field and splitting them in different weekends at Winthrop isn't viable because it divides the attendance of the fans. What would make this even weirder is the fact that you have to qualify for throw pink. So we're treating it like a major already. Uh, so let's just do it. Um, and maybe this is a reason where we look at uh, separate tours for the FPO and MPO. FPO gets U.S. Women's, European Open, U.S. DGC and Worlds. MPO gets the Champions Cup and the other three. No matter what, throw pink is a major in our hearts and our minds. Always, always. All right, Sam, wrap it up for us. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, pretty much anything I can and will say is going to be an echo of what these guys have already said. I, I don't think it makes sense for throw pink and USDGC to coincide. I don't understand. Nobody understands why Throw Pink isn't a major and why it has been an A tier. You know, it just none of that makes sense. It's never going to. I my my main point is going to be this. I don't know that there is as much incentive for a bidding process as people might think. I, somebody alluded to it a minute ago. It's that these events don't really make any money. Um, so this would be a disc golf manufacturer like Innova, like Discraft, somebody coming in and, and paying money to be able to run this event that is also going to lose money in hopes that you make a little bit of money from sales, from the, the marketing, from the exposure. But that's a, a big risk for some of these companies on what could be a rather large investment in trying to run this event. So I just don't I don't know that bidding would actually work as well, maybe as some people think it would. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. What are you guys talking about the bidding? Would it be like a bidding every year of who so, gets it? Well, here. Well, no. I think it would be you, you. Maybe maybe you try to you sign for a few years. But here's the thing. The thing about like companies owning a major. You you look at the other events and say, well, like, well, they don't make money. Well, think about this. If if I were whatever disc mania, for example, or whoever, and okay, they say to you, you can you can have champions cup. Okay. So what could I do right now to, to make that markable for number one, the first thing I remember is if I own the event, I decide who gets to vend there. I, it can be, I, I can be the only person vending at the event. Um, if I want to, Innova did that for years and years and years before they built up enough of a fan base that they thought, let's bring in other people to vend. You got to like the people were vending at hotel conference rooms down the street at USDGC. Another thing you can do is you now, like, like you, like we said before the PDGA, you know, if you're not concerned with with making the uh, making the event profitable, you're not trying to run the best event possible potentially. Like that, I think there is sometimes um, sometimes that can be part of the issue. Um, like if I'm running Champions Cup and I hear an outcry about, okay, it's not at a wooded course, I, we're taking it straight back, right? Like we're, we, I think that there is opportunity, maybe not for all the Pro Tour events. Like not every one can be this big spectacle, but I do think if the majors are spaced correctly, both on the calendar and geographically. They can be a success, and I do think they are uh, run much better. Like Innova has obviously turned it into a business. Now, well, the one thing I will say to Brody's point on my theory on why the Women's Disc Golf Championship exists is obviously um, number one. I don't think I think the PDJ just does not want to give another major away. I think that Innova. They went out and kind of when disc golf was still in the wildlands and the wild west, and they started this thing and it turned into a runaway train and the PDJ just really couldn't get in the way of that. And they'd obviously be foolish to try and do so at this point. Like imagine if they were to say, we're stripping it of its major, like nobody would, 
people would just boycott them at that point. Um, so I think that's part of the problem is they just don't want to give up another one. And then obviously I think Gary kind of touched on it, but the second reason is because I think a big part of it is that they want to have this women only event, which I do think is cool, but also it is interesting because like the men always play with the women. So it's not like it's why don't why do we have a why don't we have a men's only event right that's that's what I'm saying is like I I get it and it is important to promote women's growth in the sport and I think I I might not not be educated enough on what goes down related to that event to maybe like push that initiative like if I feel like if I saw a lot of that like here's all the things we're doing this year to try and bring new women into the sport like I I could get behind that I think but, also if it's like hey we're gonna do a women's only event because we're gonna get a lot more women to come out because they're gonna feel more comfortable playing in an event with only women then why don't they just do that for every event well I wouldn't just be financially sustainable I think that would be the answer to that. <laughs> um, I mean, for the yeah, Pro Tour, obviously, that would be like kind of impossible to operate two separate tours, considering where they're at right now. I mean, for yeah. sure. I mean, I, I, that's what I'm. Saying. Those are those are at least like my two reasons. Because yes, I think everybody. I mean, watching somebody win the Throw Pink Championship after having to qualify, going through that grueling tournament in front of the biggest crowd they're going to play in front of potentially all year long, it's very bizarre. Like they're holding this trophy and you have to remind yourself they just did all that and won an A tier. Now you win a good bit of money and that, I'm sure the player, but like it feels like this big accomplishment, but if you're listing off your accomplishments as a player, like you're hauling Hanley last year, you're like, yeah, I haven't won on the pro tour yet, but I did win probably maybe the hardest event to win on tour. It's just not a pro tour or a major. So it is like this. It's just such a weird in between that as much as I don't like this, I would rather them make it a fifth major and name it something, whatever they want, then it not be a major right now. I would, and then have five majors. I'd rather that scenario because yes, it would be weird having five majors, but it'd be better to at least award the player a major than this nonsense that it is right now. Yeah, I agree with that. But also if you're the PDGA, like you're having to split your attention so many different directions. If anything, you should be embracing the idea that someone else wants to run a major on your behalf. That way you don't have to worry about it. You know, I so totally that, that that's my big take for like why they should just let it go and let Throw Pink become USWDGC. Like that's yeah, me. and, and yeah, here's couldn't the thing. they just have an event to get a bunch of women to show up and play? It doesn't have to be a major. You could definitely do like an amateur totally. women's like USD US Am type thing. Sure, like, like try yeah. to. But then you wouldn't up. have the pro players there to bring the attention to it. So you know right. that would be the only downfall of that. The, the bottom line is the PDGA has always, when they run their majors, they always seem to put a heavy burden and heavy emphasis. Like the, the tournament ends up reflecting what the local community puts into it. Not exactly. Now, well, and they if, this no worlds, from it. if this was worlds, this tournament would have sucked. And, and like well, with, the, with all the stuff that they had to do prior, like well, that's what I'm it would have been so much work for the community to do that. I don't think right. it would have been a good tournament. So that's what I'm saying. Get, get the, these major tournaments in capable hands. You know, give MVP, they're a juggernaut in the disc golf world. Give them a major for a year. Try it out. See what MVP might, I mean, look what they do with their own tournament. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's been some complaints about MVP open, but I still think that they, they have some pride in that tournament in that course and, and what yeah. they do there. It also um, feels like the European open is like de facto kind of Dismania's majors because of how many ties are there between Dismania and the well, European yeah, and open the, with UC and stuff. So like it already kind of happens. I feel like, well, it's just another example of the further away something gets from the PDGA and what they're relying on. I don't know. I don't know. And Could maybe we, I'm way how, off, but how sweet how sweet would it be if uh Champions Cup was just at Maple Hill beginning of the, the season? I not, think not be, opposed to that. Yeah, I think it'd be, like that's, that's it'd be better what, than the alternative yeah. that we have right now, which is it totally. being basically there to be that's open. True. So yeah. Uh, like yeah that, I, I, that could be that could be a really nice uh or just forever make it Northwood Black and then Ledgestone does something different. You know, like that's yeah, another you possibility. That. I mean that you do that too, yeah. Yeah. All I know is whatever's going on at USDGC, we need more of it, and I think it. I think yep. a large part of that is because Innova is behind it and it's part of their bottom line. They've t- it's become yep. part of their business and that really changes things. Well, um, the other thing too, real fast, last thing. Also is, the only tournament they're just like running all year long. Like that helps a lot too. That That's the big one is exactly. like they're really just focused on that event. Yeah, but exactly. the other thing too is like they also don't want to look bad, right? Yeah, they don't want their exactly. brand to look bad. PDGA has constantly done things where they say, Middle finger, we don't give a flip how we look. 
And yeah. that that's the problem is like <laughs> when they're going and doing these events, they don't care if they turn out poorly because they don't care about the backlash. Yeah. Innova doesn't want the backlash of putting on the worst USDGC we've ever seen. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. telling you, man, it, 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 com- it all comes back to the PGA. Like they, probably made, they probably didn't make any money this year. With the USDGC? amount of money, with the amount yeah, of money yeah. they had to put in to get the course in conditions, I bet their margins this year were were almost probably break even. They yeah, spent a some. lot of money to get that course set up. Plus, they're not selling yeah. the broadcasting rights anymore, right? Like, I don't know how that works right. with DGN, yeah, but they used know. to own like the pay per view for it as well. Yeah, right? not get, really since sure. it was DGN, since it was DGN Pro, they probably get kickback from that, but it's a little yeah, bit. I, I doubt yeah. that it's the same. But not the yeah, same. I know it, they 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 care about the. Uh, the event and that's just what it comes down to but um okay let's hop on to our final topic here um brody and gary um we're going to talk a little bit more about the tour championship and some finances um so the dgpt just announced a purse of 300k for the tour championship with 35k going to each winner this is a decrease of 22k and 5k respectively so that's 22k from the total pot and 5k from each winner's total they got 40,000 last year um and that was kind of just thrown out there in the graphic that was in the press release. So if you were the DGPT and the purse was set with no way to change it, so this is just kind of the way things have gone, how would you have handled the situation to make a downscaling, make the downscaling less obvious? Or do you think this is no big deal, simply a reflection of the apparent downturn in the market? And do you think people will accept this kind of no problem? Because like I said, I mean, it, as soon as I saw it, you know, if you follow disc golf, it, it you at least knew the purse didn't increase. And then one quick little search and it was – you know, right there on the nose. So um, we will say Raiders lost this weekend. So Gary, do you want to go first or second? Uh, I'll go first. I mean, that was a low blow. blow, (laughs) (laughs) You know, uh, this is the third highest purse of all time. It sits just behind the tour championship from 2022, where it was 302,000. I think if we're only talking about the money here, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we need to be realistic about our sport and how it's not growing fast enough to sustain a year over year increase in the payout of this event. And I'm not necessarily hitting the panic button over the third highest purse ever. However, when you combine that with the whispers, the uncertainty that's in the air right now, like the layoffs, this might make people nervous and it might feel like one more indicator that our sport is in some kind of decline. It also feels kind of weird, like how and when it was announced, kind of felt like they were trying to be like low key about it, almost as low key as the first round of the US DGC being free on YouTube. Um, and if I were at the helm of the DGPT and I couldn't change the, the, the payouts, I would have tried to read the room better and know that everyone seems nervous. And I, you know, I want this event to be a showstopper to finish the season. So I would have just owned up to it and came out with it way earlier and pushed the narrative about how awesome it is to be able to have a chance to compete for $35,000. I would say something like, despite the current state of disc golf, we were able to put together the third largest purse of all time. Um, It's all about how you like position this and how you talk about it. So by releasing it this late, they don't get the time to control the narrative. But if I could make changes, I would have done one of two things. I would have adjusted my allocations to other tournament payouts and attempt to match last year, or I would adjust the the payouts this year to make first place 40 K second 20, um, third place, 10 K fourth place, 7.5 and kind of try to get first place back to that 40 K right now. Jeff spring to me sounds like the guy who is the new head of the ministry of magic and Harry Potter after Voldemort returned. He's there saying like, these are dark times. Our sports <laughs> face no greater threat. We ever servants defend your money. The DGPT remains strong. And then he's killed off screen. It's all about the narrative <laughs> of things. And, and, you know, they chose to let us decide what the narrative is going to be instead of creating that narrative themselves. And ultimately they're going to reap what they sow for that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of good points there. Um, <laughs> great, great Harry Potter um, analogy there. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, I can, I definitely can see that. Um, okay, Brody, what would your plan have been? Well, I would have actually taken a little playbook from uh, the PDGA. If you guys remember a couple years ago at Worlds, the PDGA (laughs) made an announcement uh, about the purse, and uh, no one was really excited about it. The number really didn't get anyone too crazy like they thought it was. They really built it up. And so magically, they came up with more money after all the ticket sales, after everything had already been done, they still somehow magically came up with more money for the purse to kind of put the icing on the cake. I think the, I think the disc golf pro tour should have done that like years ago, like don't go out with a crazy number. Like they could have gone low 
thrown out the number. And if everyone's like, holy cow, that's a lot of money. And they had all this money still left over, then they can kind of f- f- finagle it a little bit down the years. Right. But in seriousness, like this is not a good look right now. Kind of like with what Gary was saying is th- the notion right now with a lot of the moves that we're seeing in disc golf, um, with players being not resigned with uh, contracts the last couple of years, no one's really announcing big contracts. Uh, we're just seeing a big decrease. And I think if we didn't go crazy and go all in real fast, I don't think it would be that big of a difference. But I think the problem is like everyone thought this media, uh, this like meteor rise of disc golf was just going to continue, continue, continue. And what we were seeing with other companies, the Disc Golf Pro Tour, all these other companies, they also were thinking the same way as all what the fans were thinking. The only problem was the eyeballs weren't on where it needed to be. You know, like just because you have a bunch of people buying Frisbees because that's the only thing you can do right now because of COVID, that, that we did not translate those people buying Frisbees for the first time into eyeballs that actually bring in the money. And so I think it should, it could have been easily uh, seen that that was an issue when we weren't getting big numbers. I mean, I'm still kind of shocked when I go and watch like how many people are watching live on YouTube numbers aren't great. And so like, I think even this amount of money for a tournament is still pretty impressive for how many people are watching disc golf live. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree. It is pretty impressive. Um, I think, yeah, obviously if things could have been different, that would have been nice. But I do ultimately Gary's kind of plan was what I was thinking as somebody. Okay. If you tossed me this plate, basically, here's what you do. You, you make the first place prize the same. Absolutely. You change those other three. Most people are, I would, I don't even know that I would have looked at it. And then you don't announce the total purse. You just say it's the third largest purse in disc golf history. If you do those two things and you don't mention the total purse and you don't me- and you don't change the first place payout, even myself who is like looking into it probably doesn't even bat an eye. I probably just look at it real quick, say, "Oh, same as last year," and I'm moving on from it. Yeah, and I you're put- but you're putting a bandaid on like a sinkhole at that point. Like, you do we think next year magically the purse is going to be better? I think it could be the same. They have I, a whole I, year I, to figure that out. Yeah, I, no, I, I know, but I'm just saying like th- that. I, that would be like the quick fix. But the problem with that is like, eventually you're going to come to a point of where you just have to say like, Hey, the money coming in for tournaments is not as much as it used to be. And we all have to be okay with realizing what? that mm-hmm. and understand like, Hey, more people have to watch disc golf. Like that's, that's, that's how you get more money in tournament payouts. But, but if you're able to patch it up this year and this year looks like two years ago, who's to say you can't like it, in my opinion, Dick, it could stay the same for the next five years for all I care. It's, it's the decrease. And Gary mentioned the timing of, of it with the way things have looked mm-hmm. lately. It's just, it's just bad. Like it's just not, it's just not a great look. And, and I, and I also think that yes, getting out in front of it um, would have been better than nothing, but the way it came out, it was just kind of like, Oh, and it, it wasn't surprising. And it's, and ultimately it's also like Gary mentioned, it's not some shocking decrease. That's the thing too, is like, I I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready to just jump on them because I was like, yeah, there's been a little bit of less money in the sport and Hey, they still got together $300,000 and the winners are going to take home a bunch of money. But I think that it's just one of those things for me. I don't think it would have been super difficult to, to patch up. And now, and I will say this, a lot of times I think the pro tour, they do really prioritize those players like lower down the payout scale. And, and I think they do that to help out their own touring players. And I, and I can't like ha- take some huge issue with that, but from a purely marketing standpoint, um, I think reallocating to the top, just finding mm-hmm. that extra 5,000 for each dis- division somewhere like that, that would have helped. You're but, saying um, making the top the same level. I think that like yeah. well, I, I, the 40 K I don't know if you want to set like, the, that's, that's what flashes right in front of your face. It's the biggest no, part I, of the I agree. Rate. I just don't know if you want to set a precedent of like this tournament is always going to be 40. It's always going to be either the same or going up when what? you see a bigger picture. I'm sure the disc golf pro tour knows a lot more about finances than any of us do. And so there what? might be a big picture of like, Hey, next year guys, <laughs> their own finances. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. They're on fire. I'm saying they might see the big picture of like, there isn't going to be this ma- big payout next year, right? Like, yeah, I can't if they knew if that was signed on like multi year or not. 
Not sure. Well, the tough part is, even if it's not going to be as big as it is next year, it's all about the timing and that perception. I think if you come out and you you say, "Hey, we're still able to keep forty grand for the top the top earner, even thirty five, and you just you like like I said, it, this is the third highest, or they could just throw in three thousand dollars and save the second highest purse of all time. Um, I think people will go, "Oh wow, that's more than I expected. I expected this to fall off because of the things we've been seeing," and. You just have then you then you're on a clock. You got a year to make this right and get this figured out. Yeah. What do you mean um, by timing, though? Like the fact that it's that was announced on the 14th, days before the event, and so it I, kind I of think, feels. I I think they they put money towards the tour championship throughout the year. I don't know. I don't think they were sitting on this number months ago, knowing that this is what the number was going to be. That's. Uh, <laughs> It is yeah, they, they, locked, I, they had their big they, I mean they had Barbasol locked down from like the beginning. They know of the how year. much Bar yeah, they know how much Barbasol is so, gonna pay, yeah, I don't, but, yeah, but, but I don't know they don't know about the subscription. Fair, yeah, I, I mean, bet three, I think they're waiting for USDGC to see if a bunch of people upgraded right. their subscriptions. Because like 322 last year, that, that, you see what I'm that saying? is a really like, random number. Like yeah. last year's number was kind of like three hundred and twenty two thousand. It almost does kind of look like, yeah, maybe they were seeing what the subscri the subscriptions look like. I think I think they have all that stuff subsidized. I mean, when you operate when you operate off of monthly subscriptions instead of years or multi year licensing deals, yes. that is kind of, kind of win. what you get. I yeah. mean, it would follow the pattern of just the rest of the better. season, right? Yeah. Like throughout the course of the season, they've had to make different decisions. Like they've had to make two or three different rounds of layoffs. They've had to do different pivots with content. So, like I, I agree with Brody. I don't think they knew what the number was going to be probably uh, not. until recently. Uh, maybe maybe not as early as, as, as last minute as this week, but yeah. Like, what if they had to lay off some of these people to make that not like it's at three hundred thousand? What if it would have been two hundred and fifty if they didn't lay yeah. off people? You see what I'm saying? It's like, very possible. True. It could no, be a lot. Hopefully, they thinking. can. It's going to be a long term fit. thing, though. Like, if it keeps dropping year after year, that's whenever you have a problem. If you can plateau right now and keep it and park it where it is, and you'll be fine, mm -hmm. I think. Hopefully, they can figure out with doing this two years in a row now, they can kind of create some kind of um, you, prediction for that. Because how great would it be at the end of the MVP Open to be able to then say, here's the purse, and ask the winner, like, how do you feel going into next week knowing that you're playing for, or two weeks from now, knowing that you're playing for I don't this? Know. The like, purses uh, in a lot of these golf tournaments aren't announced until the week of. So it's not. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I Again, I think we focus a lot on the money right now because it's like new. Yeah, where... but this event is characterized by by the money. That, like that's the that's it's right. It's really the only thing yeah. I don't care about. Just because that is yeah, it's all there really is to it. Um, anywho, let us know in the comments down below what you think. Gary is our winner tonight. Congratulations, Gary! One more episode next week. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a wild season. Um, if you want to submit any topics to our final episode, this is your last chance to do it. You can scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. Um, maybe we'll try and write some like overarching topics. Obviously the only thing we have going on another player of the year question, maybe for the final week. Listen, I've, been clean, list. I've been clean from player list. of the year questions for weeks now. Um, but maybe, 2v2, 2v2. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll have to maybe do something special for that episode, but uh, that'll be the finale, and then we'll be on to the off-season podcast. If you didn't check out uh, the Tour Life podcast that went up last night, as of the time you're watching this, you probably should because they had some pretty cool guests on. I don't give them a lot of credit, but they did have a pretty stacked cast. If they all showed up, maybe they didn't. We'll never know. As of the time of filming this, we'll never know. Um, if they didn't, it's Silas's fault. Hashtag blame Silas. See you next time. <laughs>